Today I'm going to be talking about soybean varieties and especially focus on uh, resistance to diseases and pests. I'm going to do this after Emerson already told you that apparently resistance is not important. So anyway, uh, hopefully maybe I can convince you otherwise. So I've been sharing these talks with Randy Nelson, who's a USDA scientist housed at the University of Illinois, and he's a curator of the soybean germplasm collection. What I plan to do today is um, first uh, talk a little bit about soybean genetic gain. So Emerson actually touched on this a little bit. About, um, I'll talk about gains that we're seeing in soybean varieties and yield increases. Then I'm going to talk about yield trends with Williams and Williams 82, which are two nearly genetically identical soybean varieties. And then I'm going to talk about the USDA soybean germplasm collection. I'll talk about some soybean <laughs> diseases and pests. I'll talk about soybean cyst nematode, or SCN. I'll talk about soybean aphids. And then I'll talk about uh, phytophthora rot in soybeans. So anyway, if we look at just the USDA average yields over the last 90 years, you can see that we've got a yield trend where we're increasing yields about a third of a bushel per acre per year. And this is nationally. So this case I just went to the USDA website, downloaded the national on soybean yields. Well, if you do more statistics on this, what you can see is that actually in 1983, we can see a break point, and actually the yield increases have accelerated from that point. So we're looking at about four, uh, four tenths of a bushel per acre uh, per, or four tenths of a bushel per acre per year yield increase currently. As a soybean reader, what I'm really interested in doing is thinking about how much this yield increase is the result of improved genetics versus agronomics and other inputs. And so one way to look at that is what you can do is take old and new varieties and grow them all together in an experiment and just look to see how we, how, what yield differences are there between the old and the new varieties. And we did an experiment like that for maturity group two, three, and four varieties. We organized this test, we had collaborators throughout the Midwest and through these tests. And what you can see is that we saw a trend that was very similar to what we observed just looking at the national um, yield averages. Overall, we saw about a third of a bushel per acre per year yield increase. And since, in this case, since the 70s, we've seen about four tenths um, or over a four tenths of, a, of a, a bushel per acre per year yield increase in group twos and threes, and about a third of a bushel per acre per year in group four. Uh, so, as a soybean reader, I can look at that and say, well, it's not 80% as Emerson said, but we can claim as readers 100% of the yield increase. So, that's not really the case because we did some further analysis and the best we can come up with is probably about two-thirds of the yield increases we're observing are the result of improved genetics, uh, whereas the other third is due to improved uh, agronomics. So one of the things that soybean breeders have spent probably more time working on than maize breeders is disease resistance. Um, and um, one question I've had is, are soybean breeders wasting our time? Should we be just focused on yield, or should we actually be looking at uh, disease resistance and focusing on getting more disease resistance in the varieties? So one way we looked at this is by looking at the yield trends of Williams or Williams 82 over years. How many remember actually growing Williams or Williams 82? Yeah, a fair number of you. And in state, this was a, an exceedingly good variety, and it had probably the majority of the acreage in the Midwest. Uh, Williams was a variety released by Dr. Bernard, who was a USDA researcher here at the University of Illinois. He passed away only a year ago. He basically continued breeding soybeans until probably like three years ago. He just, even after retirement, was still out in the field uh, working on breeding, breeding soybeans. Williams 82 is almost genetically identical to Williams, except it has a phytophthora gene that crossed into it. We can look at the trends of these varieties because these were grown in the Illinois State Variety Test year after year for about 40 years. And if we just look at the Urbana location, the trend for Williams and Williams 82 is this dark line here. Whereas the yield average for the test is this greenish line. What you can see is over years, Williams, the yield is going down. 
Again, it's the same variety, but over this period of time, we're seeing this field being pulled down. The most likely explanation for this is that, in fact, we're seeing more disease pressure in our fields now than we did back in the 1970s. So as you can imagine, you know, growing soybeans every other year in these fields, we're just building up disease pressure. So for example, Williams or Williams A2 do not have SCN resistance, and we've had SCN pressure certainly build up, and we've had other disease pressures build up over time. Whereas the test average is increasing, and that's the, this increase is the result of this improved genetics. So we're constantly turning over varieties in this test, and we're putting in new genetics, and that's what we need to love. So as you can think about it, breeders, not only when they're trying to increase the yield, they're also having to work against this yield drag that we're seeing with Williams and Williams 82. And we're constantly having to deal with this new disease pressure that's trying to push our yields down. Just to be sure that Urbana was not some outlier. We also looked at uh, Dixon Springs, Brownstown, Belleville, and Carbondale because they also had Williams and Williams 82 in them over a long period of time. And we saw the same trend where Williams, the yield was going down, whereas the test average was going down. So the disease resistance we have in our soybean bodies, are lar these resistance genes are largely coming out of the soybean germplasm function. As I mentioned, this is curated by Randy Nelson, uh, who's a USDA employee here at the University of Illinois. So we've got really the privilege of having this collection housed here on campus. This collection was first established in 1949 with about 2,000 entries. So these would have been soybean types that have been collected throughout the world. The oldest lines were introduced into the U.S. in 1895, and when we bring in planting productions into the collection, they're given a PI number. So later on, I'll be talking about PI 88788 as a source of SCN resistance, and 88788 is just the inventory number of that line was given when it was brought into the U.S. Currently, the collection has over 21,000 different countries. This this graph or, or chart shows the, the progression of increase in the sessions of this collection or different soybean types in the collection. So it's, um, it started, or we had some of the first sessions were brought into the U.S. in the late 20s and uh, early 30s. At that point, actually, the USDA sent plant collectors around the world to collect different plant types. And a lot of these early ones came from China, where there were some collectors went around, traveled around China, and just collected different soybean types in fields, as well as different um, um, train stations and things like that. Then the collection was established in 1949. Another milestone is that in the 1970s, in reaction to the southern corn leaf blight epi epidemic, um, there was a lot of interest in increasing genetic diversity in crops because they saw that, boy, corn was really developing from this disease. We need to get increased diversity. So there was a great increase then in the amount of accessions of the collection, and the collection is pretty well leveled off uh, since 2000. So it's not good enough just to have all this germplasm in the collection. We need to figure out how to utilize it. So one thing is, is that for disease resistance, we can take the, the different plant introductions, we can uh, inoculate them with different pathogens, we can find uh, types or, or plant introductions that are resistant, others that are susceptible. We can take those resistant ones and then do the genetics to see whether or not they have unique uh, resistance genes. Uh, we can also screen them for uh, SDS resistance, and with this, it's a little more complicated than Phytophthora because we don't see uh, complete resistance and susceptibility. We see a gradient in responses, so we, but we can find um, plant introductions that show high level of resistance to SDS, others that are very susceptible. And we can use these, these PIs that show high levels of resistance as a source of genes to increase resistance in our varieties. But I think I'm, one of the places that the collection has really improved soybeans the most is actually on SEM or for SEM. Um, just as background, um, soybean systematode is a microscopic roundworm worm that feeds on soybean roots. 
Because it's, it's estimated to cause the most human loss of any disease or pest in the U.S. and around the world. And the estimated U.S. loss was 118 million bushels in 2010. And resistance to SCN is caused or controlled by multiple genes, but there's one gene called RHG1 that, across different sources of resistance, seems to be the most important. One of the issues, though, is that although we've got over 100 different sources of SEM resistance that have been identified from the collection, the vast majority of the varieties that are available in the Midwest all have resistance just from this PI887A. So this was based on data from the uh, Illinois Variety Test, uh, where we saw that 94% of the SEM resistant varieties just had the resistance from PI887A. Whereas the other 6% had uh, resistance from either Peking or 437654. So again, we're relying on just this one source of resistance, which is not a good thing because um, just using that one source of resistance is start resulting in the selection of the nematodes to be able to overcome this uh, source of resistance. So one of the things that I do um, as part of my job is I help manage a what's called an SCN uniform test, where we take soybean experimental lines from different uh, breeders throughout the Midwest, and we put them together in organized tests, uh, distribute the seed, and then we collect the data from all these tests. And one of the things we do is for each of our test location, we get a soil sample, and these samples are, are analyzed by the nematology lab here at the University of Illinois. And so each one of these soil samples, we get uh, um, an estimate of the number of SCN8s per 100 cc of soil. And you can see across these different um, environments, we have the egg numbers go all the way from 200 to a high of over 6,500 right there. So we see a lot of variability in this SCN infestation uh, from these soil samples. We also get what's called an HD type from these soil samples. Uh, just to, to talk about this HG type, let's look at just this first line, or this first soil sample from Iowa. It's given an HG type of 257. And what that does is it defines what types of resistance the nematodes can defeat. So what happens is we've got seven different differentials that we use, or soybean differentials we use to define these uh, soil samples. So we call this first one a 257 because it can defeat the differential number two, which is the I8788, differential number five, and differential number seven. We say it can defeat it because it has a female index of, o of 10 or over. Female index goes from zero, which, mean, which means complete resistance, to 100, which means complete susceptibility. They have kind of an arbor, arbitrary cutoff of 10 uh, to say whether the resistance is defeated or not. You can argue whether that's the right number, but they had to choose something to, to build the system. So anyway, we would say this first sample is a 257 because for differential 2, 5, and 7, we have a female index over 10. If we look across all 20 of these soil samples, what you can see is that actually 17 of these 20 samples we define that the nematodes can overcome this EIA 7A8 source of resistance. So again, this is the source of resistance in 94% of the varieties that are available in Illinois, but we can see that the nematodes are now becoming more capable of overcoming this resistance. If we did a similar study 20 years ago, we would not see so many, um, so many of these nematode samples that are able to overcome this resistance. Uh, the good news, though, is that it doesn't show that the resistance has completely failed. So over all these samples, we see that the average female index is 19. So that means, actually, that the, the resistance is 81% effective. So, I mean, that's a good sign, is that the resistance hasn't entirely failed across all these environments. However, you can find specific fields where this resistance has failed, and you really need to identify varieties that have alternative sources of resistance to control the nematode. 
Just to show the importance of resistance to SEM, what I did was I'm, I'm plotting data from a few different locations from this SEM uniform test. And on the y-axis, I have yield and bushels per acre, and on the x-axis, I have resistance to SEM. And the resistance to SEM was done actually in the greenhouse, so we took our greenhouse data, compared it to our field data, and what we basically have is a group of varieties here that are SEM susceptible, and another group of varieties that are SEM resistant. These varieties all have the PI8878 source of resistance. We have a nematode population that by definition should defeat this 8878 resistance, but you can see that this resistance is still performing very well in terms of the resistant varieties greatly outperform the susceptible varieties. So again, the resistance is still providing good control or, or good yield protection in this case. But again, this was a field that had very high SDM pressure, and I chose this because this had the highest pressure, um, over 6,500 days per 100 cc of soil. This is another location that has more moderate SCM pressure, so 440 eggs per 100 cc of soil. We can still see the trend where the resistant varieties are outperforming the susceptibles, but we don't see nearly the same, the, the same yield advantage. And finally, I had one location that had no detectable SCM pressure. And here you can see no difference in yield between the susceptibles and the resistant. The good thing there is that it shows that there's no yield trade associated with this SEM resistance. And that's one of the reasons why this 8878 source of resistance is so popular, is because breeders have been successful to, to breed high yielding varieties with this source and not have the yield trade pulling the yields down. So, um, if we look at just the SEM pressure across these different fields, again, the, one, uh, the location I showed that you saw a really steep line where we had a lot of yield advantage due to having uh, the resistance, that's kind of the outlier there. Most of these fields, we don't actually have that high assist pressure. So across all these environments, uh, the average is just over 1,100 days per 100 cc of soil. The interesting thing, though, is that the locations where we had the high cis pressure were all outside of the heart of the corn belt. Um, so the, high, the highest location was in Michigan. We also have high cis pressure in Minnesota, North Dakota, as well as Ontario. And that's something we've been seeing is that it seems like when SCN first gets into environments, we see a spike in the SCN pressure. So the SCN population explodes. Then it seems to be more moderate, and then assuming you can grow resistance, use rotation, we can fairly well control uh, the SCM. So the next uh, pest I'd like to talk about is soybean aphids. So this was first identified in North America in 2000, so it's a fairly recent pest. Um, it's mostly been a problem in the northern U.S. and southern Canada, and in Illinois we mostly see it as an issue in north, the northern part of the state. Resistance is controlled by major resistance genes. So shortly after soybean aphids were identified in North America, Glenn Hartman, who's a USDA scientist here at the University of Illinois, started screening germplasm from the soybean collection to see if there was any resistance. And fairly quickly, he, he identified three sources of resistance. Uh, Jackson Dolly, which are two old uh, varieties from the southern U.S. showed resistance, and then this PI, 200538, which is a plant introduction from uh, Japan. They show resistance because when we put aphids on plants, the aphids survive for a shorter period of time than on the susceptible, and also on these resistant plants, the aphids produce fewer progeny than on, when they were put on the susceptible. So we had sources of resistance. Fairly quickly, we were able to identify and map two genes that control aphid resistance. So one gene called um, RAG1 or RAG1. Second gene was called RAG2. So we're able to map these genes and now start to use genetic markers to incorporate these genes into soybean varieties. And we've been able to release some varieties now with these uh, aphid resistance genes, and private industry is also working with these genes. So we were excited we were able to identify these genes. We thought maybe we solved this aphid problem, but of course, Mother Nature doesn't sit by and let you do things like that. So very shortly after we identified 
this avian resistance, we're able to show that, in fact, there are different biotypes of soybean aphids. And in fact, when we first started our work, we were using this biotype 1, which was a isolate of soybean aphids that was selected in Illinois. And you can see Williams 82, which does not have aphid resistance, is susceptible to this biotype. Whereas if you have rank 1 or rank 2, you have resistance. But then we identified a, a population of aphids in Ohio that can defeat rank 1, but rank 2 was able to control that. Biotype 3 was discovered. Rank 1 can get partial resistance to it, but it can defeat rank 2. And there's a biotype identified in Wisconsin that can overcome all or both of these resistance genes. So this shows that we still need to continue to work on identifying additional resistance genes to control soybean aphids, uh, because the, the genes we now have are not controlling all the aphid population. We've done some work with Matt O'Neill, who's an entomologist at, the, uh, at Iowa State University, and this is some work that was sponsored by the North Central Soybean Research Program, where he took soybean lines that had different combinations of aphid resistance genes. And on the Y axis, we have number of aphids on the plants. And when I look at the, these results, it makes me happy that I'm not an entomologist and have to count all these aphids in the field. Uh, but anyway, um, and then we have data across the x-axis. So if you're susceptible or you don't have any resistance gene, you can see you had a very large spike in aphid population. If you had rank one, you had lower number of aphids, rank two, even lower. But if you combine the two genes, you had very good control of these aphids. This just shows data from five different environments when they did the test. So again, here we have no gene, rank one, rank two, rank one plus rank two, the two genes combined gives excellent control for, for aphids across all these locations. So again, we've identified resistance genes out of the collection, um, but there's still obviously more work to be done because of the diversity within aphids. So the last species I'd like to talk about is Phytophthora rot. Uh, so Phytophthora rot can kill plants at any stage. So you can see early season plant death. You can also see plants can die during reproductive uh, phases from this disease. Uh, it's estimated to cause anywhere from 25 to 50 million bush, million bushel yield loss per year in the U.S. Uh, resistance is controlled by major genes, like what I talked about with soybean aphids, and resistance genes have been mapped uh, that control uh, by the rock. There's actually 13 known uh, Phytophthora rot resistance genes, but rhinos in Illinois only have four different genes. And um, you can actually see what rhinos have what resistance genes by going to the uh, variety test website. So at the VIPS website, they list this. Um, the majority of the varieties in the test actually had a Phytophthora resistance gene. So uh, 242 entries of the 319 entries of the test had actually a Phytophthora rock resistance genes. These genes are called R RPS genes. So 68% of those resistant varieties had RPS1C. 23% um, had RPS1K. 7% 1A. Um, 2%, 3A, and then only one variety had a two gene combination. So again, if you go to the VIPS website, you can see these, the, these results. It's not good enough just to have resistance genes. We have to have, obviously, the right genes that can control the disease that you have in the field. Um, an issue is that nobody has done a survey to look at what races of Phytophthora are in our fields in Illinois since uh, 2002. Um, and at this test, the predominant races were uh, race 1 at 21%. This can be controlled by RPS1A, 1C, 1K, and 3A. 4, which is controlled by 1K and 3A. 7, which is controlled by 1C and 1K. And then um, finally, race 33, which is controlled by 3A. So currently, um, uh, Carl Bradley is doing a new survey to, to, to look at what races are in field. So hopefully this will be updated so readers will have a better idea what genes we need in our variety. 
So with this, I'll wrap up um, and just conclude that resistance is important in choosing RISE. Clearly, especially with the example of SEM resistance, this resistance can protect yields and, and um, help control the test. Um, something I haven't touched on is that breeders are becoming more efficient in developing varieties with these resistance genes. Because of the use of genetic markers and breeding programs, what they can do is they can actually select varieties very early in the breeding program and carry the right complement of resistance genes and only put those resistant ones in their yield test. And the big companies now have huge marker selection programs where they're testing literally probably hundreds of millions of samples through these labs to identify which potential rise have the right combinations of genes. Also, um, we do have changing soybean disease at best pressure. Just because we've got a disease resistance gene in a variety doesn't mean that it's going to control the pest or the, the strain of the pest that you might have in your field. And finally, new resistance genes are coming from the public sector. So the really important source of this resistance is the soybean germ classification. Breeders uh, like Dr. Nelson or myself, we do a lot of work in trying to identify new, new sources of resistance, looking at the genetic basis of, the, of this resistance, and getting these genes into good germ plasm that the breeding industry can then use. And with that, I need to acknowledge uh, support from the North Central Soybean Research Program, as well as the United Soybean Board uh, for the work that I've been doing.